Hello, everybody. My name is Kenneth B. Morris, Jr., and I'm the great, great, great grandson of Frederick and Anna Murray Douglas. And I'm also the great, great grandson of Booker T. Washington. And I'm honored to be back with you during Douglas Week uh, to have a Douglas Dialogues conversation with my good friend, who is a Douglas Family Scholar. Uh, she's also an advisor to our organization, Frederick Douglas Family Initiatives. We've become very close over the years. And there's so many things that I love about this person. Uh, she's been studying the Douglas family for more than 30 years. And we're gonna have a conversation about her scholarship and research and, and the books that she's working on. And, but the beautiful thing about every conversation that we have is that I always learn something about my own family from her. And she is a, a scholar at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, um, Dr. Celeste Marie Bernier. Welcome uh, to the conversation. It's so good to have you with us. What a beautiful, precious gift, Ken. Being in your airspace, even virtually, is a joy for me and um, keeps my heart going. And so I learn so much every time in our conversations. You always take me to a stratosphere of joy and happiness in understanding the beautiful legacy and the legendary life firepower of your family. So having a conversation with you, it's a dream for me. Thank you so much. Well, great. You know, I thought where we would start is, um, you know, talk about... Frederick Douglass, and of course, the importance of Anna Murray Douglas in his life. They were married for 44 years. They had five children together and 21 grandchildren. And now, of course, I descend from Frederick and Anna's youngest son, Charles Douglas. And um, I, I love talking about the children, uh, talking about the grandchildren, and then really talking about Anna because she is not really known in this history, in this story. She's been pushed aside and really is not even a footnote in the story and has not, in my opinion, been treated with the dignity and respect that she deserves. And so that one of the reasons that I'm so excited to have this conversation is because Anna was such an inspirational figure. The whole Douglas family, as I like to say, was a radical freedom fighting collective in the abolition of slavery and fighting for justice and equality was the family business. So how about we start at, with Anna? and then we can kind of just move on uh, throughout the whole family. I don't know if we have enough time. There's so many <laughs> children and grandchildren to talk about, but we'll try and squeeze it in. <laughs> well, what a beautiful place to start. Um, Anna Murray Douglas, revolutionary, liberator, founder, genius, absolutely. Um, the life's blood and the reason for existence for any of us is honoring her legacy. She was a queen, she was a life force, she was a powerhouse, and there are a million stories about her life that we haven't told, we haven't honored, we haven't respected, and we haven't remembered. Everything begins, ends, and is because of Anna Murray Douglas. So it's so beautiful and powerful to talk about her life and legacy. And my hands are about to drop off because I'm just finished her biography, Revolutionary Liberator, the Anna Murray Douglas family biography, and it is 220,000 words, and it is a wow. 300 pictures telling the life story and the legendary legacy of Anna Murray Douglas. Frederick Douglas himself, he always gets there first, right, Ken, we know this, and he got there before all of us, and he gave this beautiful interview where he schools everyone. He schools the white supremacists, the haters, the disrespecters, those who dishonor and disremember and disregard Anna Murray Douglas is a legendary powerhouse. And he tells us, Ken, he says, Anna Murray Douglas, my wife, my first and only love was responsible for my life. Everything I did was because of her. And that, that statement alone um, should have been really leading just about every uh, biography about Frederick Douglas. Uh, because it really says everything about her importance. And I know, you know, many times I've been asked over the years um, about Frederick Douglass and we venerate him and we put him up on a pedestal as we should. And we talk about um, his important work, but thinking about behind the scenes and, and some of the narratives that, that when Anna has been introduced into the story, uh, she's been pushed into the kitchen or in the garden and it's everything but that, right? 
No, oh, it's it's a it's a absolute travesty of injustice, inequality, and violence. It's nothing short of a violence to her history, her life, and her legacy. Anna Murray Douglas was an intellectual genius, a political revolutionary. She was the equal to anyone and everyone. Um, the unparalleled intellect of her husbands was only matched by her intellect. <laughs> um, they were co-liberators. We talk about their marriage for forty-four years. They're together for half a century. They meet as young. people people. They work together on the freedom struggle in on the eastern shore of Maryland, in Baltimore, in Lynn, in Rochester, in D.C. And I just love, love, love the beautiful thought that we never do justice to, that Frederick Douglass is one of the hundreds she liberates on the Underground Railroad. So if we understand Anna Murray Douglas as the Underground Railroad leader, liberator, coordinator, legend on the Eastern Shore and in Baltimore before she even gets to Lynn, before she's even recognized and renowned in Lynn, Massachusetts and Rochester, she tells Frederick Douglas when he's broken. He says, I'd given up, I was broken, I was lost. She came to me and told me I must be free. She so Anna Murray Douglas sees him running his freedom schools, sees him nearly getting murdered for running his, media, his freedom schools. Her love of education was the lifeblood of liberation. She believed that all her life. When she's in Rochester, she goes to the school teacher of Rosetta, not the white racist, white supremacist, but the white liberator and says, thank you for what you've done to my child. It is more than justice. So Anna Murray Douglas is the person who, as Frederick Douglas said, secured his self-liberation. Right. And, and I love what you said about Frederick Douglass in Baltimore, and he and Anna are thinking about a future together and um, perhaps um, running away. And what does that look like when they have children? And you said that she was the one that liberated him. And had that not happened, had she not sold her personal belongings to help finance his escape, had she not put together the disguise, the sailor's disguise that he would wear, who knows if he would have had the courage or the wherewithal to run away from slavery. And we would be a very different country sitting here today had we not had the contributions of Frederick and Anna um, as the great abolitionists and all of the other work that they would, would do. Now, I'm sitting in our offices, Frederick Douglass Family Initiatives in Rochester, New York, and I'm just down the street from the Talman building where he published the North Star newspaper and his paper. And one of the stories that you told me several months ago was about um, Anna's insistence that the children get an education, you just mentioned that um, a moment ago, but also to learn how to typeset and to work at, at the paper. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Because I find that fascinating. And also some of the descriptions um, that you talked about in your research with you know the children being there. And I think there was a story about them sitting on a stool or, or something like that. So yeah. So you talk about the family business of liberation, Ken, so beautifully. You talk about the Freedom Fighting Collective. Every person of every age, every gender was involved in the liberation movement. And the Douglas family were united life force. They were an army. And they're an army today. And you and Nettie and everything and all you're doing in the office you're sitting in right now. Um, and so time echoes of liberation are reverberating through the ages, through you and what you're doing. Absolutely. So Anna Murray Douglas and Frederick Douglas. So the liberation we often talk about is from enslavement, but then there's a liberation from a northern states that, um, as Frederick Douglass said, are bled through with the loathsome disease of black phobia um, that is killing people. We see it today in police brutality, white supremacy. We see it in all the contemporary injustices and what Frederick Douglass would describe as the spirit of slavery. So the understanding that they get out of legal enslavement in the South only to face all kinds of persecution, discrimination, disenfranchisement. One of the most important stories really is that Anna Murray Douglas is the person that is there for Douglas's liberation from enslavement, and she keeps him and her family and herself alive in the North. Mm -hmm. And this is not to be underestimated. Everybody talks about her as a private detective. That's the exact words they use, that she has constant vigilance. Everybody also talks about her as a private detective who, if you're working on the Underground Railroad, if you're Harriet Tubman, who do you go to in Rochester to, to find the best places to ensure someone's safety? You go to Anna Murray Douglas. She was a healer, a liberator, and a safeguarder and a protector. She knew her sons would die on the streets of Rochester with her husband miles away. Way. She knew the 24 seven work she's doing on the Underground Railroad. She tells him, you get those sons working with you on the newspaper. He says, 
Great idea. So the sons and Charles, your ancestor, your beautiful ancestor, his legs are not touching the ground as yes. he sat at the elbow <laughs> of his brothers and his sister. And as we all know, Rosetta was blind at the time she died because she'd spent her entire life from the age of five years old proofreading and editing on the North Star. The North Star also, as you know, as the office was an underground railroad station. So in this office, you have the voices and worlds of liberators of the Douglas family. You you have Harriet Tubman, you have Sojourner Truth, you have Harriet Jacobs, you have a Black Female Liberation Network as part of that legacy too. So the house um, here in, in Rochester, the, the last house that they lived on was burned down by an arsonist in 1872, which would force the family to move to Washington, D.C. But that house was also a station on the Underground Railroad. And there is a school that sits on the site of the old homestead, school number 12, that was renamed the Anna Murray Douglas Academy in 2018. And we were very proud that that happened. And initially, uh, the question was asked, well, why isn't the school named for Frederick Douglass? It was, it was named for Robert P. Duffy at the time. And we thought, yeah, well, it should be named for Frederick Douglass. That was our first thought and instinct. But when we started to think about this idea that Frederick was constantly on the road, he was traveling, he was out there speaking as a paid lecturer in the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. He's traveling around the world. He's published his book. He's got to go to Europe and, and, and so many things. And so Anna was in that house. Um, she was the one that was making sure the children got educated. And then she was the one that was clothing and feeding the freedom seekers that were coming through that home. Can you just talk a little bit about her work? You touched on it a little bit, but her work as a conductor on the Underground Railroad and what that meant and what Rochester meant as a station um, as freedom seekers were trying to get to Canada, uh, where slavery had already been abolished in 1834. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful question, Ken, and so beautiful that the Anna Murray Douglas Academy is on that sacred ground and the sacred history and the sacred memories of all the lives of liberators coming through that house. Anna Murray Douglas did everything. She was an educator, a family builder, an underground railroad station figurehead. The station that she ran and the station she ran, so Alexander Street, South Avenue, also the North Star um, offices um, in different premises too. Um, Anna Murray Douglas was the queen of that network and she was the person who was connected to the Loguens in Syracuse to the Myers in Albany to those working out of New York to William Still back in Philadelphia and also to all the liberators still working in Baltimore her network was vast she was famous in her own time um, we think now about her funeral there's 3,000 people at her funeral there are 3,000. Let's just take a minute for that. 3,000. And those are the only the people that could get in. There were hundreds more who couldn't get in. Then at her beloved friend, Sojourner Truth, the world liberator and philosopher and activist, um, she died a year later and there are 1,000 people at her funeral. These are huge numbers. These are world-renowned figures. It's white supremacy that has killed the memory and committed violence to get Anna Murray, against Anna Murray Douglas. She was at the heart of um, interracial networks of liberation. She had a zero tolerance tolerance in how she undertook liberation work that is an education for us all. She allowed no prejudice, no discrimination of any kind. So has one friend described it, you run your home as the council chamber of the free. And so she ran her home as the council chamber of the free. Wow. And, and let that just sink in a minute for the, the audience that there were 3000 people at her funeral. Um, and what that says about, you know, her importance and, and what she contributed to to the cause. Um, I also remember you telling me, and I believe it was in Baltimore, you know, that people would come to see her. Um, am I remember that story correctly? Oh, she she was like a celebrity. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, so we talk about Mr. Douglas as a celebrity. Mrs. Douglas was a celebrity. And so the minute she traveled, she traveled on her own repeatedly, which is often not spoken about. Um, there's various um, beautiful historians on the Eastern Shore that have figured all of that out. Priscilla Morris is a genius. Um, Anna Marie Douglas traveled. She gave she gave talks. She met with people. She kept up her friends and her friendship groups from the Eastern Shore all the way through to Rochester. And anytime she was in town arriving at the train station, there'd be a ripple and everybody would try and go to see her. But to get on her calendar was tough. It was tough. There's one friend who writes to Frederick Douglass and says, Mrs. Anna Marie Douglas was in town. I didn't see her. How do I get on her calendar? 
Yeah. And he writes another letter where he says, don't worry, it's okay. My friend told me she hadn't forgotten me. She told me she wow. hadn't forgotten me. <laughs> I love that. And these, these stories just really uh, warm my heart so much because I am as proud of Anna as I am of Frederick, uh, you know, for everything that they've done, the lessons of love, humility, and forgiveness that have been passed down through the generations. And to just hear these stories when I, I grew up, not really knowing a lot about her and I couldn't really turn to the history books because she was not in the history books. And just to hear, you know, the strength that she had and, and people, you know, would ask me, often like, well, why didn't Frederick Douglass write about her? Uh, why is um, he didn't write about his personal life? And my response is always, well, what makes you think that it was Frederick that didn't want <laughs> the, the personal life of the family out there in the public when he was doing, they were doing such dangerous work. It sounds plausible to me that that Anna was like, hey, you know, <laughs> you're not gonna come back home if you put my our family on blast like that. And, and people, um, you know, know where we are and know what we're doing. So um, it's uh, just, I love hearing these stories. And I also love the volumes of books that you're working on. And I wanna just kind of work our way through uh, the books, which include working our way through the children. But before we go to Rosetta, um, let's just talk about the Anna Murray Douglas book, how many pages are in there. And um, I know you always tell me that you don't have any fingerprints anymore because you've been writing so much, the millions of words that you've written about my family. But talk a little bit about the uh, that first volume, the Anna volume. Oh, thank you so much, Ken. I, I, I also want to start by saying you are absolutely right. Anna Murray Douglas is the director and the manager and the builder of the family. And so we are, everyone talks so much about Frederick Douglass's life at risk. All of the Frederick Douglass family, all of the Anna Murray and Frederick Douglass Family Liberation Collective put their lives on the line every day from the minute they they started breathing. So the dangers of Frederick Douglass were the dangers of Anna Murray Douglass and all the children. Every day their lives were a battleground and a war. They were a war. And so we now we know they lived, but they didn't know they were going to live. Yeah. And so Frederick Douglass was a protector, a safeguarder and a defender of his family. And he still we still need him today to do that. Right. For all the injury and pain and injustice and violence that's been committed to their legacy and their life. So, yeah, the first book, um, Anna Murray Douglas. So the thank you so much. It's eight books and it's um, Douglas Family Lives, Douglas Family Lives. So in honor of you and your mom and everyone working today. And there are two books on Anna Murray Douglas herself. So there's a book of her documents about her life. And everybody said it couldn't be done, right? There are no documents. There's no way of doing this. But if you rip up the white supremacist, um, tyrannical, oppressive way of seeing the world and follow a black liberationist, female-centered trajectory, it all becomes open. And so Anna Murray Douglas's documents book is 250,000 words and tells her life story Ooh. from what she did in the Civil War, who knew what she did in the Civil War, um, what she did on the Underground Railroad, what she did as a pioneering educator, what she did in terms of intergenerational adopted kinship, other families she saved apart from her own. So it tells her life and legacy on all of the political freedoms battlegrounds. And then the biography, Revolutionary Liberator, the Anna Murray Douglas family biography. I love that title. I love that title. <laughs> I feel that revolutionary liberator says it all. <laughs> says it all. I, I almost needed to stop there, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and that tells her life the, of this heroic freedom fighter. And we see a new Anna Murray Douglas. We see a new Frederick Douglas. We see new the new lives of the children. Um, as you say beautifully, Ken, the life at risk. We see the pseudonyms they're writing under protect themselves whilst they're doing searing human rights journalism that's changed US history and changed the nation. So really the biography is Anna Murray Douglas's family. She was the artist, as Francis Harper said. She was the creator. She was the founding mother. She made her husband's life possible, her children's lives possible. So we re-see the world through this intergenerational liberation movement, as you talk about. You had a very good segue now into talking about the children when you mentioned the pseudonyms that they uh, wrote under. And if I recall correctly, and um, I try and absorb as much as the fire hose of information that you um, <laughs> you you point my in, in my direction. But let's talk about Rosetta now. And I believe she had a pseudonym that she wrote under that was just her hers was Justice, right? 
Justice. And there are yeah. more, I'm sure, Ken. I'm sure she's toying with me on the other side of history. Um, the book, minute this book comes out, and her book is really huge too. It's 250,000 words. She was writing on all of freedom's battlegrounds. Like her mother, she was an intellectual genius, a political revolutionary. She was a human rights philosopher. She was her father's researcher. Um, everybody asked, how did he do everything? Well, he didn't. He had a whole family. His army were doing it by his side. And yes, her pen name was Justice. And she used that pen name to take down the the white judicial system in ways we still need her today. So working really to fight on all of freedom's battlegrounds, legally, politically, socially, culturally, to talk about the ways in which black people across the world are murdered by white supremacy and persecuted. She absolutely, like her mother and her father and her brothers and her sisters, was invested in human rights and liberation for all. Because without liberation for all, there's liberation for no one, right? A Douglas family belief. Yeah, and that that is so beautiful. And just uh, for the audience, just for the information, we've said a few times that Frederick and Anna had five children. So in order to descend from Frederick and Anna, it's either through Rosetta's line or through Charles's line. Lewis didn't have any children. Annie died at 10 years old. And Frederick Douglass Jr.'s, all of his children um, passed away before reaching adulthood uh, for the most part. So that's just a little nugget of information. And I've been uh, very honored to meet my cousins um, in recent years that descend from Rosetta. So it's it's just uh, such a beautiful thing. And the Douglas family lives on, the Douglas lives live on. And, and we're continuing that work and trying to make sure that we're teaching uh, the next generation of leaders and freedom fighters the importance of the Douglas family and that freedom fighting collective. Uh, let's talk about Lewis and what his volume looks like and, and, and what he did and his contributions to the cause. Thank you so much, Ken, and um, I'll, I'll absolutely do that. What you've just beautifully said makes me think of one story, and I don't want to kill your heart, but but be ready. Um, so one of the stories Anna Murray Douglas loved to tell was her favorite story. And so often people don't talk about her as a storyteller, right? She was a beautiful storyteller. Mm. Um, she had a phenomenal memory. Everybody spoke about her intellectual cerebral powers unrivaled she had this beautiful memory and it kept them alive she never had to write anything down on the underground railroad it's not safe to write anything down she knew that secrecy depended on liberation the story she told was the love of her husband when their eldest daughter rosetta was born how frederick douglas would take his little girl in his arms and say no one can rest you from us you are free right slave is going to take you from us and just tells us that this young couple who met on the eastern shore uh, as young people in their teenage years decided to save their engagement to get their liberation to get to new york they didn't know if they'd die by the time they reached there and built this beautiful family in freedom i always think about you know frederick Douglass's time in slavery where he had been separated from his mother he didn't know who his father was he had been separated from his brothers and sisters, and he was truly, and his grandmother, his grandmother, you know, walked him into the gates, the hell of slavery um, when he was a, a young boy. And so he truly was an orphan with no family, no home and no country. And to think that when he finally did have a family and he finally had a daughter, he had a child of his own. And what you just beautifully said about um, that nobody's gonna be able to wrest away my daughter uh, for me and 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 just the the pride that he would have had in his children and the love that he would have had for his family. And also, you know, he was away a lot. He was traveling and he missed his family. Can you talk, you know, talk about what it was like for him to be away from his family when he's traveling in Europe and when he's out on the road? It nearly killed him, Ken, and it nearly killed them. Yeah, it's absolutely the sacrifices they paid to not be with one another for the liberation movement. Um, everyone talks about Frederick Douglass and his traveling. He's exhausted. He's mentally, psychologically, physically traumatized and exhausted. He's in the UK for two years, um, separated from his wife and children. They're separated from him. Um, what they gave up, what they sacrificed every day, as, as Anna Murray and Frederick Douglass felt with Lewis and Charles at the front lines in the Civil War, so it was for them decades before. They were frightened to death. There'd be news of the death of, of Frederick Douglass or Anna Murray Douglass. None of this was certain. They were all at war, and the battles they sacrificed every day on the home front 
Um, and that home fronts the Underground Railroad. It's the fight against white supremacy. It's the fight against white enslavers, let alone Frederick Douglass battling with white enslavers in Britain, um, risking his life, giving talks to thousands of people. This was absolutely a family who sacrificed everything. They experienced destitution, starvation. Um, they experienced every form of hate, every form of psychological breakdown. And what's even more powerful is they chose it because they understood it was necessary necessary for liberation. They willfully chose to put themselves in situations where they would emotionally, physically, psychologically face certain death. And that's where Anna Murray Douglas's phrase, why not I endure a hardship that my race may be free, mm. belong to all of them. That was It wasn't um, something you put down. It was in your blood and your bone and your sinew. Mm. We know from our U.S. history that Douglas lobbied Abraham Lincoln to allow black soldiers to fight uh, for the Union Army in the Civil War. And two of his uh, first recruits were his own sons. And think about the courage that it would take, um, not only for the sons, but for mother and father to say, you know, we believe in this cause enough that our sons are going to be, you know, volunteer recruits um, in the Massachusetts 54th. So that would be Charles, my great great grandfather, and Lewis. And I'm sure some of the audience knows about their service um, in the Battle of Fort Wagner, um, but I think that probably lesser known is Frederick Douglass Jr.'s work and um, around this time in the Civil War. So if you can just talk about the three sons and what they did in service um, to the Union Army. They, they were powerful freedom fighting heroes, Ken. Um, Lewis Henry, Charles Raymond, and Frederick Douglass Jr. went to the physical battlefront of the war. And you're absolutely right, Ken, much less is talked about Frederick Douglass Jr. and how he risked his life on the battlefront. Um, all of the sons worked in recruitment even before they're at the front lines. And that was a soul mind killing process in Northern states full of white racist haters and persecutors, mobs and torturers. They all risked their lives to even recruit the army um, before the army could even begin um, training at camp uh, in camp. Um, all of the sons served distinguished military service. Um, Lewis Henry Douglas's letters from the front lines are mm a power of black combat heroism in the Civil War. And as he said, and as we know, he said, if I die tonight, I die in the cause of liberty and humanity. Um, Charles Raymond Douglas faced the siege at Petersburg. He was the first person to take a white Confederate prisoner. Um, he was known for his courage. He lost his hearing. He lost his entire hearing in his right ear because a gun exploded next to him and suffered injuries, as did his brother, all throughout his life. Um, as they talked about it, we hear the gun guns exploding behind us. We don't know if we will live, but we will. Well, there's a beautiful letter that um, Charles writes his mother and father. He says, um, I do not like to say goodbye. Um, Frederick Douglass Jr., um, absolutely right, Ken. You just beautifully encapsulated that. No one talks about his heroism. Um, Whilst I think there's still work to be done on the service he did on the front lines, and I'm convinced he fought as a combat soldier on the front lines, we just haven't put the full picture together yet because he talks about his combat service. Mm. Um, what we do know is that he recruited in Vicksburg, Mississippi. So he spent time recruiting in Vicksburg, Mississippi. What he saw in Vicksburg, Mississippi, of what had happened to people living in enslavement in Vicksburg, Mississippi, let alone the white supremacist torture of the Union Army, murdering black people, um, torturing, committing violence against them, he carried all his life. The scars and the wounds of war were part of Frederick Douglass Jr.'s memory. And what he saw, the injustices, the inequalities of so-called freedom fighting white Union soldiers, versus the reality of what they were doing. He's really lent to his philosophy. He had a he was one of the real vanguard for theorizing egalitarian politics and what it would actually look like for the US nation versus what we said it was. The sons had some level of privilege because they were the children of the great Frederick Douglass and Anna Murray Douglass. And, and I'm proud of their, their heroism and their service because of the fact that they believed in the cause so much that they would risk their own freedom, risk their own lives. And I'm reminded of that battle on Morris Island in Charleston Harbor where Lewis is injured and he has to be nursed back to health. And talk a little bit about that story. 
Well, that is just such a powerful story to tell, Ken, because he writes his mom and dad a letter and he tells them, we would have survived if the white troops had been made to come up behind us. So he really exposed what was happening at the front lines for black combat soldiers, how men shot from behind, men shot from the front by white army soldiers who were not believing egality, liberty and freedom. And so Lewis Henry Douglas um, becomes, as, I'm, as you know, one of the most important campaigners for veterans rights, as does Charles Raymond Douglas, your ancestor, safeguarding the safety of black soldiers to fight for a nation that's going to kill them in their own beds. Mm, that's so powerful. Let's move on to the youngest freedom fighter, and uh, that's Annie Douglas. And I find her story so fascinating in her short uh, time on this earth, but the impact that she had as the youngest uh, freedom fighter. And then also we have that beautiful photograph that was discovered um, with Frederick and Annie uh, prior to the discovery of that photograph, if you went to the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site in the Anacostia neighbor, neighborhood of Washington, D.C., and you looked at the family tree on the wall, you would see pictures of Frederick and Anna and the four children, and there would just be a blank space for Annie. And now we know what she looks like. We see the pride in her father's face, and he's kind of slouched down a little bit in the chair to um, get kind of closer to her level. But I just find her story just fascinating. Oh, well, Ken, thank you so much for asking me about Annie Douglas. What a privilege. Um, so Frederick Douglass got recognized, as he said, as a man among men. I think we can say that Anna Murray Douglas is recognized as a woman among women. <laughs> and Annie Douglas needs to be honored today as a child among children. So what we really understand in her life is her life as a freedom fighter was lived. We have the, the tragedy and the pain and the heartbreak that can't even begin to be imagined of her loss at 10 years, 11 months and 21 days. But in those 10 years, 11 months and 21 days, she changed US history. She was working on the Underground Railroad from four, probably earlier. Mm -hmm. She was a scholarly protege. She could speak German better than German children in Rochester. She so far excelled them. Her accent was better, she told her father. She was <laughs> an historian. She was an orator. She um, wrote to her father jubilantly about this piece she was going to speak in school, and I'm using her words, and it's an anti-slavery piece. So she's an anti-slavery orator at the age of 10, talking about he is the man for me who speaks of liberty. So liberty is always the lifeblood of the family. She is, and I will stake my life and die on this claim, she was the political advisor to John Brown. Everybody yeah. talks in a white male adult centric way, which is beautiful. I understand it. But um, they talk and on about as they should John Brown. But John Brown needed inspiration. He needed advisors. He needed intellectual confidants. Those intellectual philosophers of human rights were Anna Murray and Annie Douglas. He's in the home far longer than anybody imagined. He's by himself with Anna Murray and Annie Douglas. And together, I believe they are working as political philosophers of human rights. And those bricks of Annie Annie's that yeah. are being used. I'm, she's helping physician them. I know it. I know it. <laughs> so he, he, John Brown is at the Douglas family home here in Rochester. And yeah. how much time does he spend in that home? Repeatedly, weeks at a time over years. And mm -hmm. there was a letter that Annie wrote after um, John Brown was hung and um, and how that, that whole, the trauma of that, because John Brown became like, like an uncle to her. And we also we often look at the these historical things that happened and we look at it from you know, the perspective of history, looking back in history and not really thinking about how it would also affect the people around them, the families around them, the friends around them. But John Brown's hanging, I know, had great impact on Annie's life. Absolutely. And in the words of your ancestor, Charles Raymond Douglas, it killed her. That experience killed her. Um, Charles Raymond Douglas talks about um, when John Brown is executed, how it devastates his younger sister. And emotionally, physically, um, it, he, de he describes it as she, she died for grief of the, of the death of John Brown and also worry for her father, who's forced to leave the country under the white supremacist order of the Governor Wise. 
um, the 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 power of what you're saying, Ken, in the loss of the experiences and the memories is the lifeblood of all of this. Um, Annie Douglas puts on history at the age of 10, that poor hard-hearted man said, John Brown must die. They took him to an open field and hung him. That's in a letter she writes to her father. So she is 10 years old, a journalist, a reporter from the front lines, a firsthand witness and experiencer and philosopher of what happened to John Brown. She knew she was um, a philosopher and thinker, freedom thinker in the tradition of liberation and needs to be honored as a founding figure in that history. And do we know how she died? And, and obviously she was very young. Um, what are the circumstances around her her death? So the the it's powerful that you asked that, Ken. So the the medical examiners and the family testimony is she died of a hemorrhage on the brain very suddenly, um, and the hemorrhage on the brain is a, is very inhumane. And what was talked about, especially by her older sister, who was devastated, everybody was devastated by um, her death, um, is that she suffered greatly. These are Rosetta's words. Before she died, she suffered greatly. Um, and the sentence none of us will ever forget, she said the last word that she could say was mother before she died. Mm. Wow. Is there any um, written record of how uh, Frederick uh, responded to, to her death? He was absolutely grief stricken and traumatized. So he was 3000 miles away and the time, so Rosetta is trying to get the news to him um, and it's a difficult process. She finally gets the news to him and he's in air, um, home of Robert Burns in Scotland when he gets the news and he's back in a church that he'd visited 12 years before and a tiny, tiny church. I visited it, it's still standing. It's a, it's a block of apartments today, but it still exists, it still stands. And there's 2000 people in the room a people outside and a Scottish, a white Scottish journalist says, we saw the great man get up, stand up, sit down. And mm. he struggled on. So Frederick Douglass was giving speeches when his heart was breaking. Um, and the power of this experience that a mother and father go through, he's having to give speeches to 2000 people. Um, a story I don't think I've told you, Ken, is that Anna Murray Douglas, in the days after Annie Douglas's death, she takes Charles, who's then only 15, and together they go to the Logwen family. And mm -hmm. Caroline and Jermaine Wesley Logwen were their family, their collaborators forever. Um, Amelia marries Lewis Henry Douglas, of course. Mm -hmm. But Caroline and Jermaine had lost their daughter, Elizabeth Letitia, at 12 years old. And she was a contemporary of Annie Douglas. She was a founder of an anti-slavery children's society. And they understood her grief. They understood what she'd lost. I can't even imagine um, you know, what that would have been like to be so far away, have to continue with the work, continue giving the speeches. And you know, through the grief, it's just unimaginable. As you know, Frederick and Anna and Annie are buried at the same plot in Mount Hope Cemetery and, and Rosetta is buried uh, with her husband, Nathan, a short distance away. And if you were to come visit the grave site, the family site prior to 2022, uh, there were no markers on the ground for Anna and Annie. Um, they, their names were on the main headstone on the sides of it. And on September 3rd of 2022, we unveiled a memorials for Anna and Annie with beautiful inscriptions that you helped us helped us write. And so they're finally again being recognized. And um, when, so when people visit Mount Hope Cemetery, you'll see those new markers. And it's just was such a joy. And September 3rd, the symbolism of that day, of course, that was the day that Anna helped Frederick Bailey uh, run away from slavery. And you were at that ceremony and it was just a, a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I just wanted to just put that out there for the audience. Um, so if you're in Rochester, I'll make sure you go and visit Mount Hope Cemetery and pay reverence to, to the Douglas family. Now, as we start to close here, I wanna transition to the grandchildren. Uh, you've told me stories about the, um, the grandbabies, the girls, uh, braiding Frederick Douglass's hair with colorful ribbons. And, and I love all of the ana anecdotes that you share uh, that, that really humanize him. And again, 
He's got a family that he loves and they're in Washington, D.C., which at the home, which is now the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site. But just tell me about the grandchildren and any stories uh, that you may have and and just the work or correspondence that your research has found um, between grandchildren or grandchildren to grandparents, um, anything that you might be able to share with the audience. Oh, thank you, Ken. And thank you so beautifully for mentioning the monument that's changed forever, Erica Mark, and those beautiful words on those headstones in a Mount Hope Cemetery. Everybody rest together. The family joined together is such a powerful transformation. And the grandchildren are absolutely legendary. There are so many stories, Ken, and I'm sure, you know, there are so many beautiful, powerful stories. So as you said, there's 21 grandchildren. And you also told the powerful story of how many how many die young you know there's a lot of children that die in their babyhood a lot that die in their childhood um and it's actually 14 of those children die die young and so the the pain and the suffering of the grandchildren that die too young in the family is something that their grandfather and grandmother find almost too much to bear. Um, at the same time, there's the beautiful stories of the braiding of the hair, the, the stories of um, Frederica Douglas Bragg Perry tells all these beautiful stories of sitting with her sisters, braiding Frederick Douglas's hair, and they're getting carried away. They've got ribbons, they've got it all going on. <laughs> um, they're having the best time. And then there's a knock at the door and it's the president or a senator. And yeah. what I love about the story is grandfather is whisked away by Anna Murray and Rosetta <laughs> and they have to work fast to unbraid the yeah. hair and uh, but this also happens when they're playing wheelbarrow when they're playing leapfrog when they're playing Freddie Douglas had a whole um physical education regime that got him into a lot of trouble with Rosetta um he mm -hmm. would make sure she was out so that he because he had a view that the the grandbabies may, female and male were going to get the same physical education and as Frederica said he didn't like any crying <laughs> <laughs> he said that's when they get handed back to their mothers in shame <laughs> yeah I, I love that visual of them taking the braids out of his hair because he certainly is known for a lot of things um one of those is that the great big white hair and um that just that mane that he had and just to just to picture them, first of all, the braids in the hair, but them just taking them out so that he can greet dignitaries. And I'm hello, I'm Mr. Frederick Douglass. <laughs> welcome, welcome to my home. That's that's just a, such a, a beautiful story. Um, any other uh, stories that you have of the grandchildren or their work as as freedom fighters? And and you know, I'm going to ask you about my great grandfather Joseph. But before I jump to Joseph, the violinist, and and that whole relationship that Frederick Douglass had with, as we say in our line, the favorite grandchild. I don't necessarily know that that's true, but <laughs> that's how we describe that relationship. But any other um, stories of the grandchildren and, and their work? Oh, there's so many beautiful stories, Ken, and you've shared some already um, that are so powerful. One I especially like is when they're all very little, There's a they had this beautiful phrase that grandfather could speak like the sun, but like thunder too. And so mm. there's this great moment where he had a very clear understanding of what was playtime and work time that they all carried through all their lives. And if you disturb grandpa in playtime, you'd hear his voice of thunder. <laughs> <He's great. laughs> I love that. So there's what happens is, and it, and and Frederica said, none of us girls would get into trouble, but the boys would try it. So they would try and tiptoe along to his study. And then he'd open the door and in thunder say, who goes there? And they'd have to go back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So uh, many people know of Frederick Douglass as this Renaissance man that was the most photographed American of the 19th century. Uh, we know that he taught himself to read and write over the objections of his overseers. But not many people know that he taught himself to play the fiddle or the violin. Tell the story about him being, I, I believe it was in Scotland, and uh, walking past a store. And I, I, this is just a fascinating story to me. Oh, it's such a beautiful story. So it speaks back to Ken to what you beautifully asked about what he went through when he was apart from his family. And so he's 2000 miles, 3000 miles away from home, I should know. Um, and he's in Scotland, he's in Edinburgh. And he says, one of his most beautiful heartbreaking phrases, he says, there was no living for me. So he struggled with suicidal depression, he struggled with being able to stay on this earth with everything he'd experienced and gone through, but knowing he had to for the cause of freedom's battleground. And so he decides, he leaves his hotel and he walks down the main street of Edinburgh and he finds a violin shop. 
And he goes in and he buys this, you know, and very amusingly, um, when he's having this conversation with the violin owners, they don't, they think the violin's not worth that much. And he starts to play and they're like, wow, we should charge more for that. Violin. <laughs> <laughs> because he makes it sing so beautifully but he takes this violin back to the hotel and he says let any and again healing for all of us today let any of us those of us who have the madness upon them and have the fits of melancholy take up a violin take up a musical instrument and you will be as i was as lively as a cricket and loving as a lamb and he told all his grand, so all the grandchildren were virtuoso. Obviously, Joseph Henry Douglas, world famous virtuoso, violinist, composer, educator. He was also the most beautiful painter in the universe, could do everything. As similarly with all the grandchildren, they were all singers, um, pianists, violinists. They could play guitarists. Freddie Douglas was an incredible guitarist. We don't ever speak about him in that way. Um, he would just pick things up and we get bored in meetings. He'd pick up his guitar and play it in the corner. And all the grandchildren were were extraordinarily gifted. And what's so powerful, you asked about what they did with their lives, that talent, as Frederick Douglass writes to Joseph Henry Douglass, he says, be not a merry toy, help your race to rise. Mm. And mm. As your beautiful ancestor, Fanny, talks about that powerful moment. And she said the greatest ambition of her husband's life was to inspire musical appreciation in communities where that's been denied, destroyed by white supremacy. So what Joseph Henry Douglas did in terms of sharing the love of music for transformation, for liberation, um, was astonishing and astounding. And Frederick Douglas wrote him many poems commemorating his dear Joe as a liberator, as well as a virtuoso, as well as an educator, as well as the talented, gifted artist that he was. You mentioned my great grandmother, Fanny, and just a bunch of memories just came flooding back into my mind. And Fanny was married to Joseph, the grandson. And Fanny was a, a musician herself, a piano player. And they she off, often accompanied jo Joseph uh, for his, his concerts. And Fanny met Frederick Douglass when she was a little girl. She was about seven or eight years old in Atlanta. Her father, David T. Howard, who was also born into slavery and became the first a licensed black mortis mortician in the state of Georgia. And he was a philanthropist. He was one of the founders of Big Bethel AME Church. Uh, there's a school name for him that Martin Luther King attended as in when, it, when he was in elementary school. And so there's that whole legacy on that side of the family of my great, great grandfather, David T. Howard. But Fanny would talk about, and we called her Grandmere, that was our name for her. Uh, she would talk about meeting Frederick Douglass as a little girl and what she remembered about him was his great big white hair and his smile and just his really commanding presence. And I spent all of my summers at Frederick Douglass's summer beach house on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay in a place called Highland Beach, Maryland. And at the top of that house was a tower that uh, Charles Douglass, he built the house for his father. And he asked Frederick, are there any special features that you want in the house? And Frederick said, yes, I want it to point it in a certain direction and I want it to be on the water. And I want you to build a tower at the top because what he wanted to do at the end of his life in retirement was look back across the water, look back across the Chesapeake Bay because on the other side, you can see land and that land is the Eastern shore of Maryland where he had been born into slavery with the name Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey and where he had toiled away in chains. And even though I'm his great, great, great grandson, when I think about Fanny, she touched his hands and her hands touched mine. And so even with all those greats, I'm just one person away from him. And um, just the stories that, that she would tell. And of course, when I was younger, I didn't appreciate it as much as, as I would now, but the memories of her playing piano in the house. And I didn't get a chance to meet Joseph because he passed away. <laughs> Um, even before my my mother was born. But Joseph was a concert violinist. He was taught initially by Frederick Douglass. So Frederick Douglass was a great educator and teacher. And Joseph would continue his music education at the Boston Conservatory of Music. And just a couple of years ago, there was a lobby in one of the buildings there that was dedicated and renamed for Joseph Douglass. So his legacy of music continues on. He played in the White House on several occasions, and he was the first Black classical re recording artist for the Victor Talking Machine Company. And so it was just an extraordinary family, Black excellence everywhere. And I just am so pleased and just, just so honored and thankful to you that you've spent your life 
uh, studying and writing about my family so that these stories and these legacies can inspire people, inspire generations to come. What will our great, great, great grandchildren say about us 150 years from now in this moment in time? Were we on the right side of history or on the wrong side of history? And the Douglas Family Collective, the stories are going to be out there in 2024. People will be inspired by them. And so I just thank you so much for the work that you've been doing. And I can't wait to shock the world with these stories and with these volumes of books that are be, be coming out. And before we close, if you can just talk about the publication of them, where you are in the completion of the writing and how much work um, you, you still have to do and, and how it's going to be available so that everybody will have an opportunity to learn these stories, be inspired by these stories and to read your words. Thank you so much, Ken. And, and I just wanted to end as well with Joseph Henry Douglas and maybe a story you don't know about his brother, the, um, Jet Charles Frederick Douglas. Um, and there's a beautiful story Charles Frederick Douglass was a beautiful violinist, as was Charles Raymond Douglass. Everybody was a beautiful violinist. And there's this great story before Joseph is born of Charles Frederick. Charles is Douglas, Charles Raymond Douglas is out, gone to government where it comes back and he hears this noise. And Charles Frederick Douglass has taken his violin and is trying his best at four. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, that's a story I didn't know. And as I always say, that I, I learned something about my family new every time I talk talk to you. And there were several nuggets of information that you've given me here during our conversation that I did not know. So thank you for that. I will put that in my arsenal of stories when I'm out there talking to the students in, in, in the schools and, and sharing these stories with them. So um, again, thank you very much. Just uh, let's, let's finish up here. Just talk about those volumes of books and, and where you are in the writing and when can the audience expect them and how will they be available for the public to be able to experience all of this work. Well, bless you, Ken, and thank you. And thank you for your patience over the years. When we were first talking about it, it was one book. Yes. So, <laughs> so thank you for not giving up on me. And thank you, Nettie, your mom, not giving up on me. Um, you all had every right to give up on me. Um, so it's eight books. It's two over 2 million words, um, 1,500 mm. images. And there's um, two books on Anna Marie Douglas. There's a book each on Rosetta, Lewis Henry, Frederick Jr., Charles Raymond Douglas. And there's a book on Annie Douglas and the grandchildren. And we are moving them along now um so they're all hopefully the six books of documents um sharing with the world their voices their testimony their lives what they did who they were is going to be coming out in the next year um the biography is hopefully coming out in the next year and what's so beautiful about the documents books is they will be free so they will be open access digitally so that people can share these words and worlds with the world and use them as a toolkit for revolution today what do you hope that scholars that are um, read this information and are exposed to this information will take away from your research and your writing? That liberation was of everyone and for everyone, and that every individual could work in the movement, was respected, was honored, was celebrated in an Anna Murray and Frederick Douglass female lib family liberation movement that was for all and of all, and believed that everybody was equal with their dying breath. Mm. I think that's a great place to end. I always enjoy our conversations. I, I love talking to you about my family. It never gets old. And I look forward to when we do this again next year uh, for our Douglas Dialogues number four. Um, Celeste, thank you very much. And um, you know, let's let's keep pushing this thing forward. As we say, this ring of fire that's around us. And uh, we are about to, uh, I'll say once again, shock the world with this information. So thank you very much for, for joining me today. Bless you and thank you, Ken. I appreciate and love you and all your family so much, past, present and future. <laughs> thank you.